that was fighting for gay rights mm -hmm. and people were killed. Nobody they were killed at Stonewall. Nobody was Nobody killed. Was if you've been a part of the RuPaul's Drag Race fandom, you've most likely heard about the elusive producers that control many aspects of what goes on behind the scenes of the show. To many, there isn't a lot that we know about the production members, aside from what they've let us know through interviews. So in this video, we're going to be exploring the production of World of Wonder, the origins of the company, and the drama that they've had with Queens as the years went by. But before we start, please make sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and follow me on Twitter at GreenGayYT for updates on future videos. Now, now, let's begin. With every reality show, we have the cast members who are in front of the cameras and the people that work behind the cameras to put it all together. When we talk about producers, it's important to understand that there's different types. For example, we have the executive producers that have the most power within the production. One of them is RuPaul, who always has the last say on big decisions. But the rest of the executive producers make decisions such as which challenges will occur, the runway themes, and the trajectories of queens that they feel is the most worth sharing. We also have the consulting or supervisor producers like John Polly, who used to host the Extra Lap Recap show from the World of Wonder YouTube channel. Yet the production department that has gotten the most criticism over the years has been the story producers. Story producers create storylines and oversee the natural story that the cast forms as the season is being filmed, later helping convey that story through the editing process. And they're a pretty important part when it comes to making the show entertaining, because not every cast is as clever as the queens such as season 3, who provided producers with so much material to build off of including the Heathers vs. Booger storyline that happened behind the scenes, but story producers encouraged them to incorporate it within the filming of the episodes, which allowed them to create solid storylines for Queens moving forward. One of the OG story producers in particular would end up getting into some drama with Willem and Jeremy, but we'll get into that in just a second. Storylines are very important because it's what adds depth to the events that we see unfold on every episode. It creates a connection that expands across the season. Naturally, it's common sense that RuPaul's Drag Race isn't like a normal drag queen pageant. It's first and foremost a reality TV show. The skills and performance styles of each of the queens matters a lot, because production needs to establish which of the queens will be the best to really showcase and gravitate towards the viewers. When it really comes down to it, we wouldn't get to know the queens or even get confessional segments if there wasn't a need to skillfully portray to us relatable and interesting characters through story arcs. And this is a process that happens with all types of reality TV shows. So then, what makes World of Wonder any different? The first network to greenlight RuPaul's Drag Race was Logo TV. Logo is a part of Viacom, which features a variety of popular and highly valued brands such as MTV, Comedy Central, and VH1, which are all networks that Drag Race would end up switching between as the years went by. While these networks are the ones that air the seasons of the franchise, World of Wonder is the production company that creates the episodes of RuPaul's Drag Race. They sort of work separately from the networks that buy the show once the season is about to air. While networks like VH1 do do still have some degree of involvement, they mostly just take a back seat by overseeing the overall way a season is going and setting a list of expectations of what they'd like to see happen, even if they're not directly influential in the show. When it comes to RuPaul's Drag Race, we know that RuPaul is at the top of the pyramid. At the end of the day, he's always going to be the one that has the final say on decisions. But that's not to say that he doesn't get advice from producers. I guess the question here is, at what point in the series did RuPaul go from making key decisions such as which queen would make it to the finale? and inevitably win the crown, to now just following the advice of whatever production feels would make the most sense. Maybe Rue is still just as involved as she was in earlier seasons, because it does seem like he still enjoys her job as a host. That being said, while RuPaul definitely broke down barriers to get to where she is now, there's some key figures that helped RuPaul throughout his journey. For example, the two original founders who created World of Wonder are Fenton Bailey and Randy Barbado. These two have arguably the most amount of influence on the production after RuPaul. Yet Yet what's interesting is that their connection to RuPaul dates back decades. Fenton Bailey and Randy Barbados' working relationship goes back all the way to the 1980s, where they both met at NYU when they attended film school together. They would briefly date each other, but ultimately found that they had a special bond. They knew that in their future, they wanted to be able to work in the film industry, but it wouldn't be easy without financial resources. So in order to make money so that they could invest into their filmmaking dreams, they decided to create a band called The Fabulous Pop-Tarts. 
Pop-Tarts. The fabulous Pop-Tarts would last a couple years, and they performed at many local bars, especially within the New York City. You can even find footage of them available on YouTube if you search hard enough. Yet they admittedly realized that making hit songs wasn't as easy as they expected it would be. But it was nevertheless a method for them to express themselves artistically and live out their dreams. A very endearing part about the early days of World of Wonder is how before the company was even officially founded, the two actually met RuPaul in the early 1980s. They were both walking down the street of New York City and encountered a six foot tall drag queen dressed in shoulder pads, a jock strap, and a dry wig. The queen in question was RuPaul, who was pasting some flyers to telephone poles that stated, RuPaul is everything a foreshadowing of how Rue would literally become the face of drag. They both could tell even in those moments that Rue had something so special and that they would be a part of each other's lives in some way or another as the years went by. You have to remember that 40 years ago, things weren't how they are now it was really hard to get into the Hollywood industry, especially for queer men. So both Randy and Fenton were faced with many challenges ahead. It also didn't help that the pair had a strong passion for wanting to tell stories of marginalized groups, which wasn't much of a hot topic within mainstream media. Many of their projects were sort of shoestringed together because of the lack of resources that were available to them. Yet that's what made a lot of their work so special. What they also saw was the rise in reality TV genre that would plant a seed into their mind that would eventually manifest in the future. World of Wonder was officially founded in 1991. They had many failed projects that didn't gain too much popularity, while also having some that they did find mild success with. Along with that, as the two built their friendship with RuPaul, Ru would end up asking the two of them to manage his music career, which is how they ended up shooting the video for his track, Supermodel. That would end up being a huge hit and jumpstarted the platform that RuPaul built his legacy on. By 1996, World of Wonder created the RuPaul show, but it wasn't easy because it took a lot of convincing to get VH1 to even want to have the show in their network. But to everyone's surprise, the concept of having a drag queen having their own talk show was absurd enough to actually manage to build an audience that was entertained by it. It added to the specialness that their production company really had, because it told stories that nobody had seen before. There was no restrictions, so they both thought outside of the box as much as they possibly could. As mentioned before, World of Wonders early days was aimed to showcase stories of people that hadn't really been shown in the media. So one of their main main goals in their journey was to stay true to their artistic integrity. The fact that they covered such niche subjects made it so that they could properly foster an audience that shared the same visions that they did. Eventually though, things began to slow down. The RuPaul show ended, and at the turn of the early 2000s, the United States had entered a conservative era under George W. Bush. It was clear that there was a noticeable shift, especially when it came to the art form of the queer community. There was no longer an opportunity to flourish, and gay people were once again a taboo subject. Something I did find kind of interesting was that in 2006, World of Wonder ended up producing a season for Perez Hilton's new reality TV show that would center around his life as an internet influencer. Perez actually reached out to World of Wonder and they immediately expressed interest. The show would end up being a four episode season that centered around Perez's life, aiming to show a different side of him. Now, I wasn't able to find any of the episodes to watch for myself, but judging by the fact that there was never a season two, we can safely assume that it flopped. Maybe that's why Perez decided to spoil Raja as the winner of season Season 3 before the cast was even announced. Yet obviously, for World of Wonder, their first big hit came with RuPaul's Drag Race. But even that was a struggle. RuPaul's Drag Race was pitched to different networks for about 10 years. They even took it to Logo TV many times that rejected them on multiple occasions because it seemed that nobody was interested in seeing drag queens on TV. There was also the fact that drag queens were such a marginal thing within society that only really could have created a small viewership of queer people. Eventually, World of Wonder sort of gave up on trying to pitch the show. That was until a new member joined their staff, which was the same person who would go on to be an executive producer by the name of Tom Campbell. Tom Campbell had previously worked with MTV before joining World of Wonder, and felt that they should still be pitching the idea of RuPaul's Drag Race. Fenton Bailey credits Tom Campbell for being insistent that they continue to try and sell the show to networks despite the many rejections that they had experienced over the years, until eventually they managed to convince Logo TV. So after this point, we all know how the story 
story goes. Drag Race goes on to slowly build momentum with every consecutive season, receiving a bigger jump in popularity as the years went by. Season 4 would become the first season to really start to get talked about, with Season 5 already having one of the largest boosts in viewership. While after this point the franchise would only get bigger, this would inevitably result in the production of World of Wonder having to face with many different types of dramas throughout their journey of making the show. Specifically when it came to issues that came with queens that had competed on their seasons, but claimed that they had been mistreated or that the company is a lot shadier than it seems. Despite this, in some early interviews, one of the executive producers of World of Wonder mentioned how their process of making reality TV sort of defied the shady cheap methods of storytelling that were present in many other reality shows. With quote, if you allow people to do all the booze and pills that they want off camera and film the results, you can have a reality show. But we didn't want to do that sort of thing. He adds that when pitching RuPaul's Drag Race, he didn't want to pitch it as gay people being mean and shady to each other. They wanted to simply showcase the art form of drag. Which is funny because most of the more memorable moments from the earlier seasons tended to be shady moments. This leads us to one of the more dramatic stories that happened in 2013 during the airing of season 5. We all know that Willem has never been shy to speak her mind when needed, calling out the production of the show for many years, especially after the Matthew Anderson situation. Yet, what I didn't realize was just how far into the past the extent of their drama reached. In February 2013, Season 5 had just aired the episode where Monica Beverly Hills ended up receiving a video message from her mother, during the same point in the competition where she revealed to the judges and fellow queens that she was a transgender woman. Willem ended up going on social media to shade on Tucked for showing that message message of Monica's mom, which he felt was kind of emotionally manipulative considering what she was going through. Yet, that's when one of the staff members from World of Wonder, who was a story producer on Willem's season of Drag Race, got defensive and tried to go in on him as they both proceeded to drag each other. Willem ended the post with quote, dirty producing equals good producing. That's when the story producer responded by claiming that what Willem is saying is just not true, and that even if it was, it's just the pot calling the kettle black. Willem replied by saying that this wasn't the time or place, but the producer did not give up there, saying, quote, bring it, and that Willem was full of it. Willem clarifies that she was referring to Untucked and not Drag Race itself, because it's emotionally manipulative, and points out that when he was in Untucked for season 4, producers had issues with Willem for not playing along enough with the stories that were unfolding between the queens, so much so that they asked him to leave the room and had to apologize to get him back into filming. It ended with him saying, quote, if you really think it's professional or a good idea to comment back, go ahead. But the story producer had plenty of time that day, saying that she doesn't even work for Untucked, and that Willem has been able to get away with a lot of BS over the years, and that she's finally snapped. After that, Willem gives a snarky response, and the story producer continues the thread by saying, quote, I've never seen you have a real conversation with anyone, but I'm game. Come up and talk to me face to face. Willem then agrees and tries to establish a meeting at her office at World of Wonder, but the producer responded by saying, that at the time, she was working at another show unrelated to World of Wonder, and corrects Willem by saying that she works in an office and not a cubicle. She feels the need to point out that she doesn't party nearly as much as Willem does, and invites Willem to confront her if they ever see each other in public. Yet that's when Willem reveals that the producer that had apologized to Willem during the filming of season 4 Untucked was actually the same guy that was now her new boss, presumably Stephen Corfe, which Willem has name dropped many times in the past, adding, quote, I bet you wish she didn't engage now. The story producer's last reply is that she isn't afraid of Willem, and while Willem tried to continue the conversation, the producer then stopped engaging any further. Willem also said that that same story producer that had gotten into an argument with her on Facebook had made one of the queens from season 5 change their shirt during filming because they didn't want queens wearing any of Willem's merch. Willem and other Rue girls have also accused many producers from the set for collecting different queens as if they were playing cards. There was also the claims that we all know about how a production member that was known to sleep and have hooked up with many of the queens over the course of the seasons, one of which was Willem on season 4 and allegedly Pearl on season 7, was the same person that was Willem's story producer during season 4's Untucked. In the years between the airing of season 4, which happened in early 2012, and the filming of All Stars 2, which happened in the summer of 2015, over the years, these producers would end up sort of climbing the ranks, until finally becoming executive producers with the start of season 8. 
eight. What's funny is that by the time All Stars 2 was about to become a thing, two people that had bad blood with Willem were now executive producers. It seems as though Willem not being cast on All Stars 2 was out of personal dislike that the producers had for him. But despite the drama that was going on with Willem, production was still able to focus on their own projects to make good TV for the masses. When it comes to producing things, it's been stated that it's dependent entirely on the queen, such as their energy levels and the relationships that they form with each other. Which makes sense, I mean, you could have a queen that is super talented and very good at what she does, but if she's also super quiet all the time and doesn't offer any memorable moments that showcases her personality, then from a production standpoint, it doesn't make sense to keep someone who isn't providing you with good content to work with, which can then lead to queens that go home a lot earlier than they maybe should have. Willem also called out why she felt that the All-Stars 2 twist to have the top two lip sync for the chance to send one of the bottom queens home was controversial. To her, it seemed like the producers knew the drama wouldn't happen on All-Stars 2, because the queens were too concerned with not coming across as shady or a villain again. So production had to create drama by making the queens themselves in charge of who goes home every week. And honestly, it worked. The twist allowed for some very dramatic television, with the queens being extremely tense and production not having to be blamed for how the story went. This was actually a common theory back in the day that I completely forgot about until doing research for this video. But it's sort of a double-edged sword, because while I can see how that could have well in fact have been the case, the way that this format would end up shifting the whole direction of the franchise is something that I never want to see changed. In a way, it really helped rebirth the franchise at the time. Anyways, as I was gathering research for this video, I ended up finding some old audio files from a viewing party that Jeremy Carey and Tatiana had attended during the airing of All Stars 2 Episode 3. If you watched my video on Jeremy Carey, then you'd know about how he called out the producers of the show for editing him to seem a lot worse than he actually was, or that her producer took Jiggly Caliente out for lunch and told her not to talk to Jeremy anymore because she was a bad influence and even worse than Willem. A producer took my best friend out to lunch, y'all can figure who that is, and told her that she should not talk to me anymore, and because I'm a bad influence, and that I'm worse than Willem Bella. <laughs> Which Willem Bella is a f***ing star, so thank you! So, no, that, like, sh like that bothers me, because that just shows, like, they're, they're maliciously out to get you. This has nothing to do with a set, but you, you f***ing went out and took my friend out to lunch to sit there and tell her not to be my friend. Oh. Like, what the f*** is wrong with you? This is what I was talking about, like, the bully situation. Me, Roxy, anybody out there that, that has this bullshit villain Ellen, or villain edit, it's bullshit because we're not the bullies. Somebody else is. I'm a bully. Jeremy revealed during that viewing party that in the years leading up to All Stars 2, producers noticed that Jeremy had lost a lot of weight. So they invited him out to get some chili. It's during that lunch meeting that they would tell her, quote, we love you, we care about you, and we want to give you this redemption story. And that inevitably her time was going to come. Essentially, they sold her this idea that the hate that she had been receiving from the fan base nonstop would finally come to an end. They also went up to her again in DragCon 2015, where they mentioned her redemption story storyline one last time because at that point she already knew that she had been cast. Of course, we all know that Jeremy would end up having a not very good run because she came across to many fans almost the same way she was portrayed on season 4. This led to Jeremy calling out the show many times online and speaking on the mistreatment from World of Wonder producers against him. That's when a mystery producer texted Jeremy complaining about her, only for Jeremy to be really confused and ask her who she was. At one point, Jeremy ended up finding out who the mystery producer was, and adds that this is the reason why fans shouldn't be working at World of Wonder. So let's read this. Oh my god, watching stupid ass Fifi long boring reddit. Huh? Just shaking my head. I'm confused. Who is this? Oh, never mind. My mistake. I'll ask the other girls. No worries. XO. So I sent out a mass text to my girlfriends. Thanks, Mish. So why the fuck are you talking shit behind my back if you're writing the story for this show? Like, that just shows to me who the fuck is fake and who the fuck is real. You don't need to be doing that. And this is exactly why fans should not be working at World of Wonder. We have to go to sleep at night with people genuinely thinking that we're assholes or that we actually have these feelings. And they go home with a padded paycheck. And it's really upsetting to me. It's really upsetting because I, I put a lot of my heart and faith in these people that they have in my back and then 
The whole purpose of a story producer is to be able to create dramatic storylines for the season. But the allegations of one of these producers actually going as far as to try to get in the middle of a queen's friendship with other people, and her basically texting another fellow producer to talk crap about Jeremy, sort of just makes me wonder how many other queens have had to deal with this sort of behavior. It also adds a whole nother layer because it went from someone who was just trying to do their job to clearly having a personal vendetta against certain queens. While all this was happening, Willem, to no one's surprise, was a strong supporter of Jeremy's claims. Willem tweeted out that two of the producers from World of Wonder were currently at Mickey's in West Hollywood, insinuating once again that some of them like to collect queens like playing cards. And what seems like sarcasm ends with him alluding that they sometimes cross the line. She also gives a warning to the queens that are auditioning for future seasons, because this is something that they're also going to have to be dealing with. As the years went by, World of Wonder would start receiving Emmys for their seasons. They'd also hire Raven to be Rue's new makeup artist, and would let go of workers such as Matthew Anderson or Delta Work. It's important to know that a lot of the producers that Willem has name dropped did in fact work on the show for most of its run. However, I'm not sure if they are still working at World of Wonder, as I have not seen any of their names in the ending credits of the most recent seasons. Which I was kind of confused by, because whenever I hear Willem mentioning any of their names on his podcast, it seems as though they're currently still working there. But again, neither of their names are on IMDb, or in the ending credits for the most recent season. But correct me if I'm wrong. What's in a way sort of exciting to think about depending on how you look at it are the amount of behind the scenes information that will be leaked at some point in the future. What makes me think this is that the same producer that had gotten into an argument with Willem replied in March 2018 to a post Bianca Del Rio had shared on Facebook regarding a post about some of the more controversial moments from the show spilled by the Queen. The producer commented that people will believe anything that they are told by queens who have been on the show but that she just can't wait until she's able to spill the tea in her tell-all behind-the-scenes book, ending with, quote, My receipt box is full to the brim. It's interesting to think of the future books that will be released by people that had worked so closely to the making of the show. For now, it's best for them to stay quiet, but I can't imagine the shenanigans that will one day be learned about them. With all that we've covered so far, I want to ask a question. When it comes to the creation of RuPaul's Drag Race, we have countless seasons of some of the best reality TV that's been created, especially geared towards the LGBT demographic. So, when it comes to queens who end up getting a terrible showing of themselves once the episodes begin airing, who's really to blame? Is it the producers that make dramatic TV? Or is it the queens who, despite knowing the risk, still compete on the show? Or is it the fans who use the stories that they see during the season to decide who they want to bully? The reason I ask this is because it's sort of hard to just blindly pin the producers as bad people, just because they work to get the most entertaining product possible with every episode they make. Because without that, we wouldn't have a lot of those moments that we now look back on and find iconic. But we also can't deny that there's been a lot of collateral damage that results in many queens that had to endure a much tougher career due to the negative reception from the fans. And along with the many questionable things that many production members have been accused of doing, it really does raise some concerns. But what do you think? In March 2017, Pandora Box made a tweet that she would later on delete where she tagged World of Wonder and said that one of the producers had repeatedly treated her like crap for four years, and that she's kept quiet until then. Now, I'm not sure what it was that Pandora had an issue with, but if we use this as an example, if Pandora had gone the route to constantly call out World of Wonder, she most likely wouldn't have ended up being cast on All Star 6. Pearl is also the same situation, of a queen that said something negative about RuPaul and ended up being blacklisted from the show. I wonder if the relationship with the queens would have been easier to handle had many of the producers from World of Wonder had been rotated every now and then. But it's also true that the series has in fact showcased a lot of positive and uplifting stories that has resonated with viewers, so it's kind of a double-edged sword. Yet, should World of Wonder have more patience with queens that speak negatively about their company, or are they in the right to exclude them from future projects? What I mean by this is that a couple years ago, World of Wonder created the Wowie Awards, which were largely made to celebrate the universe within the Drag Race community, because there wasn't a lot of recognition aimed at many of these queens because the franchise was just so niche. And to this day, even though it's super mainstream, one could argue that there's still not a lot of organizations that recognize Queen's talents. I mean, even with all the Emmys that the show's gotten, it's more so tied to the producers that make the show rather than the contestants in it. 
although some of their categories seem to exclude some major alumni from the franchise. As you may already know, Willem, along with Alaska, found a lot of success with their podcast, Race Chaser, which later allowed them to create the Moguls of Media Network, aka the Mom Network. The name comes as a parody of the World of Wonder Network, but aside from that, they're a pretty well-established company. They've taken on many queens that now work with the Mom Network, including Delta Work, who would have never been able to have her own show under World of Wonder. It sort of creates more opportunities for queens who are trying to seek ways of establishing and growing their platforms by not having to bend over backwards to please World of Wonder. It was also discussed very recently that Joseph Shepherd, who is known for his many exposed interviews with queens over the years, and who last year began doing his own interview series at DragCon LA, where he made many interviews with each queen that visited his booth. Yet this year, he was informed last minute that DragCon would not be able to offer him a booth, along with a subsequent statement from the convention that they would no longer be allowing podcasts to take place within the space. Keep in mind, Joseph now works with the Mom Network, along with Willem in Alaska, so that could explain why. It's clear that decisions like this allows them to have more control over what information is getting out there, especially if it may come at the company's expense. So it makes sense that they would want to prevent any drama from going on, but could this be a step too far? Despite all of this, I still think it's important to remember the World of Wonder is an independent company that really broke down many barriers that were ahead of them in order to make this journey possible. In many of these instances, we've never gotten to get a full and concise story because they usually choose to remain quiet, which makes sense and it's what probably has allowed for the series to continue flourishing in the way that it has. And rightfully so. Something that the founders of World of Wonder once said was that their ambition was to eventually have their own network channel where they would air Drag Race content all day. And honestly, I could really see that happening. After all, we not only have countless seasons of Drag Race that they can now air as reruns, but they also have all the mini-series that they have on the WoW Presents streaming platform. Which, by the way, a lot of the shows should be given a lot more love. My favorite one being the Jasmine Masters series, which honestly is one of the best things they've ever done. Anyways, World of Wonder is the fruition of the work of Fenton Bailey and Randy Barbado, and how Faith brought them to RuPaul, inevitably birthing the cultural defining show that we all tune in to watch today. Randy credits the success of the franchise to three things. The first is RuPaul, the second is the queens, and the third is the people who make the show, which helped change pop culture and queer nightlife for the better. Yet as time goes by, we're left with a production that sometimes feels like it kind of monopolized the empire of drag, with many alumni from the show now being blacklisted from the franchise, and other queens fearing to say what they really think so that they don't end up in World of Wonder's bad graces. Regardless, it's clear that in the future, there will be more and more stories that come out, and more and more seasons to be entertained by. I want to take a moment to thank my patron. In the Elite Pink Squad, we have Matthew Burns, Gay Uncle, Wendell Norris Realtor, Tyler Henry. Hendrix MD, Poppers Alberta, and Sari Tish. And in the gay squad, we have Ethan Von Queer and Emma Malander. And finally, in the green squad, we have Azure, Cayman Rider Furry, Franny Fishtix, Edgar Allan Pup, O Nicole, the only Sean and LP. If you'd like to see your name on the screen, you can support me on Patreon. The link will be in the description. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, because I swear, like, most of you don't subscribe, but you really should. Fo also, follow me on Twitter at GreenGayYT for updates on future content. Like this video and comment below what you thought about the topic, and I'll see you guys next time.